Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures. I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, your host uh, here at Virginia Tech um, University Library. Wow. Uh, Improving the intro every week is, is great. It's not like scripted at all. And yet I still can't say the sentences apparently. Anyway, hi. Uh, welcome to the stream. Um, we are uh, live on two channels as always. Uh, Twitch.tv slash DTUL Studios and Twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Welcome in to the program um, where we look at materials from special collections in the University Archives here at Virginia Tech. Uh, because we are at Virginia Tech, um, it is important that we actually pay attention to what the institution says regarding its history since, hey, archives are about history. So, uh, I like to start off this stream with the Land and Labor Acknowledgement, the official one from the university. Uh, so, I'm just going to read that out now and then we'll talk about what we're going to do on today's show. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudalo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitment falls short of our institutional responsibility. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudalo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous students, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia's tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive DT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosin, that I may serve, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So uh, that is the commitment that has been put out by the institution, and I, I think it is important to continually uh, look at that. Uh, we, we're here weekly, and we look at it every week. So. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge it. Uh, P squared, hello and welcome. A volume check. And quieter than the background music. Let me... Hello, test. Let me see if I can bump the volume on the microphone. Uh, let me know if that has... Um, Improved the sound much better. Got it. Nope, I just had to step over and, and hit the little slider there. Um, hello, Fluid Anne. Hello, Hannah, and thank you so much for the resubscription. Um, and Fluid Anne, thank you for the Prime subscription. Awesome. I, I'm glad that that improved the balance. Um, so uh, usually there's not a lot of, like, activity in this room, uh, although we've been getting sound panels put up, the room is, is better, they've got the bar up above with the uh, camera hanging from the ceiling now so that hopefully I can do some larger format stuff in the future. Um, but this week in particular, uh, they are preparing for a show that's going to be on the VTUL Studios channel one hour after my program finishes, um, because tonight uh, it's going to be the first role of play of 2022. Role of play, if you're not familiar, is the TTRPG uh, one-shot show that the Virginia Tech University Libraries has had going since the fall of 2020. Yeah, fall of 2020. Um, where every one-shot is based on some sort of piece of literature, and literature is defined broadly. Uh, so... It's become more of a special event thing. We were trying to do it every two weeks, and it just was a lot of work to make that happen. So now it's more of a special event thing, and we'll put them together when we can. Uh, and so the 
the episode of Role of Play happening tonight at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time is... Um, I'm looking at details so I get them right. Uh, it is going to be a game based on the opera Rusalka by Dvorak. Uh, they'll be playing D&D 5e, and um, it's going to be Alice, who regularly streams on the VTUL Studios channel, uh, often doing the music creation streams. Um, joined by music faculty Chris Campo-Bowen, Scott Haydenberg, uh, Caitlin Martinkus, and Elizabeth McLean. Uh, so... It says, they'll dive into a D&D 5e game based on the opera and Slavic mythology. So uh, that's coming up at 5.30 on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. And hey, look, Lord Portico dropped a little shout out in the chat here on uh, the Rogan27 channel for anybody who needs a link over to the VTUL Studios channel for that one shot later today. Anybody who's watching on the VTUL Studios channel, come back at 5.30 for... Uh, some TTRPG goodness. Uh, yeah, it'll be definitely, it'll be on the VODs for the library's channel and then later on the YouTube for the library's channel. Um, but yeah, but don't go now. <laughs> right now, we're here and we're gonna, um, you know, be doing archivesy stuff. Oh, Key Squared, thank you for the 100 bits. Um, so I, I should probably talk about what we're going to look at today on stream, and uh, to do that, we're going to do what we often do and start at Wikipedia. <laughs> because, um, yes, I am a professional archivist, I have a master's in library and information science, and I'm starting at Wikipedia, because Wikipedia is a great source for introductory primer information. You know nothing about a topic? you're gonna get some decent beginner information about the topic from Wikipedia, and from there, you can dig deeper. Uh, so that is what Wikipedia is actually good for, is basic primer information. Um, you're not gonna cite it in papers that you write, you're not gonna use it for scientific research or, or anything like that, but uh, it is great for initially introducing yourself to a topic that you're unfamiliar with. Um, yeah, so let me, uh, the Wikipedia that I am going to is the Wikipedia for National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry, um, which sounds like a mouthful, but this was a viewer request a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember exactly who, uh, I think it might've been Key Squared, but I, I don't recall for sure, somebody asked that I look into the Grange movement and what we might have for it, and so that is what we are looking at today. Also, I do note that there's a kite train on the Rogan 27 channel, so thank you for that. Ooh, and I see 16-Bit Eric just brought over uh, the Whimsies. Welcome in, Whimsies. Uh, welcome to Archival Adventures. Um, you know me as Rogan 27. I am uh, also the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech and uh, streaming to both the Rogan27 channel and twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. Um, so welcome in. Uh, thank you for dropping that shout out in there, Lord Portico. Um, I hope you all had fun over on uh, Eric's channel. Hi, Rykar. Hi, Key Squared again. Hi, Thorkel. Um, for all of you just arriving, I know that you're all very interested in TTRPGs because that is uh, a lot of what Eric ends up talking about. Um, very knowledgeable for anybody who's not familiar, 16-bit Eric. Uh, definitely worth a follow if you're at all interested in role-playing games. But coming up tonight on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios, which is one of the two channels I am live on currently, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, so an hour after my stream is done, uh, there will be a one-shot D&D uh, 5e game featuring music faculty from Virginia Tech playing a game based on the opera Rusalka. So uh, if you're at all interested in that, uh, feel free to pop over to twitch.tv slash Studios for that one-shot uh, later tonight. Um, but uh, for now, the show, that, the show that I'm doing right now is about archives, and we had a viewer about two weeks ago, I think, 
um, ask what we might have about the Grange movement, or the Granger movement. I got quiet again. Um, testing. I'm going to attempt to fix the sound problems. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, is, is it any better with my fan off? I'll be sad if it is, but I will turn the fan off. I can also lo try and lower the music. Uh, but do let me know how the sound is. very hard to lower the volume on the music anymore. I can, I, I, I will check. Um, do, do, do. Hello, microphone. Uh, I can try and boost it some more. Um, It gets better as soon as I walk away. Uh, is it any better now? Too loud now? I'm going to um, try and get you the sound balance that will be good for you. Uh, how is it now? I'm. I'm Back sitting in front of you all. If, if the if the dials were closer to me, I wouldn't have to to get up. Okay, that's that. I apologize. Uh, like I literally have the music as low as I can make it. Um, nope. I, I'm not using the laptop mic. Uh, the laptop mic is being used for the captions. Uh, this is the thing. Um, it is a slightly different, like the microphone piece is different than the one that I normally have. But um, as long as you all can hear me, that's totally fine. So if you can't hear me, if it's still wacky, let me know. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to move on uh, and actually talk about what we're looking at today. Uh, so the material we're looking at today, it was a request from uh, somebody in the community I'm also going to turn the fan back on because it's ridiculously hot. If the fan gets to be a problem, let me know. Um, anyway, uh, we, it, the, the proposal from the audience was um, to look at what we have here about the Grange movement, or the Granger movement, um, as it was known. And I honestly had never really even heard of it. So uh, I was intrigued. Uh, the Grange, officially named the National Grange of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry, is a social organization in the United States that encourages families to band together to promote the economic and political well-being of the community and agriculture. The Grange, founded after the Civil War, United States Civil War, American Civil War, in 1867 is the oldest American agricultural advocacy group with a national scope. The Grange actively lobbied state legislatures and Congress for political goals such as the Granger Laws to lower rates charged by railroads and rural free mail delivery by the post office. In 2005, they had a membership of 160,000 with organizations in 2,100 communities in 36 states. It's headquartered in Washington, D.C. in a building built by the organization in 1960. Many rural communities in the United States still have a Grange Hall and local Granges still serve as the center of rural life for many farming communities. So, hi, just here for coffee. So I had never heard of this before, uh, but we are a land grant institution here at Virginia Tech, which means that we're very much tied into agriculture. Um, we have an agriculture program here. There's a lot of infrastructure at the university that's been here since the university started that is related to agriculture. So the fact that I've been here like five and a half years, six years, and 
had never heard of the Grange movement made me curious. I did find enough material to take up a two hour uh, session here, but surprisingly, I, I kind of expected that I would find more knowing it was related to agriculture, but uh, we're gonna look at what I did actually find. So let me go ahead and switch this over so that you can see documents as we look at them and we'll explore what I found in the archives. All right, as you can see, I have a new table that I'm at today. Uh, slightly larger than what I was at before, but um, one of the things I found in our rare books collection is this, the Declaration of the National Grange with Constitution and Bylaws of the State Grange of Connecticut of the Order of Patrons of Husbandry adopted at the annual session of the State Grange, December 1885, with amendments and additions to December 1st, 1907. Uh, this was printed in East, Hart East Hartford in 1907. So this gives the declaration of purposes for the National Grange, the overall national organization, and then it has the constitution and bylaws for the Connecticut State Organization. No idea why the one that we have in our collection is for Connecticut, but the information about uh, the national organization should be worthwhile, and since we're starting from a, a position of basically knowing nothing about the Granger movement or the National Grange, I thought this would be a good document to start with. <clears throat> so let's see what the Declaration of Purposes is for this organization, and then I do actually have some original documents from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute Grange, uh, which did exist, um, as well as some cookbooks and other things produced by the organization that we'll continue with after we look at the purposes here. Uh, Declaration of Purposes, National Grange, issued by Executive Committee, Connecticut State Grange, um, preamble, Profoundly impressed with the truth that the National Grange of the United States should definitely proclaim to the world its general objects, we hereby unanimously make this declaration of purposes of the patrons of husbandry. Is everybody familiar with the concept of husbandry? <clears throat> so husbandry... It is not referring to um, the term husband, as in husband and wife, uh, that sort of thing. Husbandry is the care, cultivation, and breeding of crops and animals. So essentially farming, um, for anybody who might have been unfamiliar with that term. Um, general objects. United by the strong and faithful tie of agriculture, we mutually resolve to labor for the good of the order, our country, and mankind. We heartily endorse the motto, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Okay, that seems decent enough. Essentials. I assume being like things you must have to live, food, water, etc. In essentials, unity, why not? Uh, Non-essentials, liberty, so freedom to choose beyond that. And in all things, charity, meaning uh, basically just be kind to other people. It seems like a good uh, philosophy, but yeah, Lord Portico, it would be good to know what their definitions were for those. Um, <clears throat> specific objects. We shall endeavor to advance our cause by laboring to accomplish the following objects. To deliver a better and higher manhood and womanhood among ourselves. This is from 1907. Honestly, I wouldn't expect terribly different language today um, because the gender binary still exists uh, <laughs> as a concept that a lot of society uh, uses without thinking. Um, to develop a better and higher manhood and womanhood among ourselves, to enhance the comforts and attractions of our homes, 
and strengthen our attachment to our pursuits to foster mutual understanding and cooperation, to maintain inviolate our laws and to emulate each other in labor, to hasten the good time coming, to reduce our expenses. Sorry, what does that mean? To hasten the good time coming. I have no I okay, I shouldn't say I have no idea what that means. I have suspicions about what that means, but I don't know for certain. <clears throat> to me that reads as possibly references to Christian doctrine, but I don't know. At least they remembered women exist better than many things of the time. This is true. Prosperous future? That's a possibility, Lord Portico. I will say, this is this um, specific document uh, originally adopted 1885, amendments and additions 1907. Um, it has all these lofty phrases at, and it's talking about uh, specifically, it, it refers to men and women. Hey, great, women made the cut. Um, it talks about the family, it talks about community, it talks about uh, organizing for the support of all, it talks about all these things. 100% this did not include people of color. All of these broad statements of support everybody, at the time they were written, I have no doubt, only meant white people. This was, uh, the National Grange was formed immediately following the American Civil War. Um, it was still quite common that black people were not included in things like that. They were free to form their own fraternal organizations, but fraternal organizations that were formed <coughs> by white people were for white people. Um, and in fact, I don't know if we looked at um, the Oddfellows materials. Even if we have, I need to look at the Oddfellows materials again. Oddfellows Hall, uh, it, we had a local chapter here. Um, and I'm trying to remember the full name. The Independent Order of Oddfellows. <clears throat> was a fraternal organization for black men, and then they had the Sisters of Ruth. Uh, I think it was Sisters. Might have been Daughters. I can't remember. Um, that was for the women, well, I will remember when we actually look at that collection, which, uh, you know, I can throw that on the schedule for in a couple of weeks. There's an International Order of Oddfellow Cemetery and Street in Denton, Texas, near where you live. That's cool, Thorkel. Are, was it an organization that you were familiar with beyond just that they have a street and a cemetery? Um, it was not an organization I had heard of, but honestly, I, I barely know anything about fraternal organizations to begin with. So things like the, uh, the Lions Club or the Kiwanis or any, any of those organizations, uh, beyond the fact that they exist, I really know nothing about them. They were not really a part of my life. Uh, so the fact that I'm familiar with the names of some of the white people's fraternal organizations, it's not terribly surprising that I was not familiar with uh, the same type of organizations for people of color. Well, Thorkel, I, I, will, I will share the materials that we have um, in a couple weeks. I have something planned for next week, but I think the week after is free, and so I can, I can plan to do uh, Oddfellows in two weeks. Since we're looking at uh, somewhat related material and, and it would be interesting to explore that. 
Um, I think it's worth doing. <clears throat> um, all right, I got stuck on a sentence. Let, let us move past that sentence. <coughs> to hasten the good time coming, to reduce our expenses, both individual and corporate, to buy less and produce more in order to make our farms self-sustaining, to diversify our crops and crop no more than we can cultivate, to condense the weight of our exports, selling less in the bushel and more, of, more on hoof and in fleece, less in lint and more in warp and woof, to systemize or sorry, systematize our work and calculate intelligently on probabilities to discountenance the credit system, the mortgage system, the fashion system, and every other system tending to prodigality and bankruptcy. Yes, agricultural sustainability. This is a thing that they were actually interested in. Uh, we propose meeting together, talking together, working together, buying together, selling together, and in general, acting together for our mutual protection and advancement as occasion may require. We shall avoid litigation as much as possible by arbitration in the Grange. We shall constantly strive to secure harmony, goodwill, vital brotherhood among ourselves, and to make our order perpetual. We shall earnestly endeavor to suppress personal, local, sectional, and national prejudices, all unhealthy rivalry, all selfish ambition. Faithful adherence to these principles will ensure our mental, moral, social, and material advancement. <laughs> also angry at every other system, apparently. <clears throat> Possibly. Um, Stuff about business, education. Education would be interesting. <coughs> business relations. For our business interests, we desire to bring producers and consumers, farmers and manufacturers, into the most direct and friendly relations. Hence, we must dispense with a surplus of middlemen. Not that we are unfriendly to them, but we do not need them and their surplus and their exactions diminish our profits. We wage no aggressive warfare against any other interests whatsoever, or whatever. On the contrary, all our acts and all our efforts, so far as business is concerned, are not only for the benefit of the producer and consumer, but also for all other interests that tend to bring these two into speedy and economical contact. Hence, we hold that transportation of companies of every kind are necessary to our success that their interests are intimately connected with our interests, and harmonious action is mutually advantageous. Keeping in view the first sentence of our Declaration of Principles of Action, that individual happiness depends upon general prosperity. Well, there's a quote that is applicable today as well. Um, we shall therefore advocate for every state the increase in every pr pr uh, practicable way of all facilities for transporting cheaply to the seaboard or between home producers and consumers all the productions of our country. Wow. So to me, this is, this is surprisingly relevant to the moment of today where a lot of the, one of the main driving forces, by, by no means the only main driving force, but one of the uh, large driving forces of um, economic inflation uh, in the United States today is uh, related to transportation of goods from production to consumption. Uh, there, are backlogs in the transit systems that get things from the producers to the consumers. Uh, so the fact that they, they existed more than 100 years ago specifically for advocating uh, for good cooperation and infrastructure with regard to agricultural produce uh, 
seems relevant. <coughs> and I mean, they're still in existence today. I don't know uh, how much they lobby. They're not something I hear a lot about. We adopt it as our fixed purpose to open out the channels in nature's great arteries that the lifeblood of commerce may flow free. <laughs> You're worried we may not have made much progress. Um, I mean, it is possible. Let's see what they said about education. We shall advance the cause of education among ourselves and for our children by all just means within our power. We especially advocate for our agricultural and industrial colleges that practical agriculture, domestic science, and all the arts which adorn the home be taught in the courses of study. <clears throat> so, they want schools to teach about agriculture, which seems totally in line with their purposes for existence. Um, it, it doesn't seem like an outlier in their statement of purposes. Uh, and then this next section, the Grange, not partisan. We emphatically and sincerely assert the oft-repeated truth taught in our organic law that the Grange, national, state, or subordinate, is not a political or a party organization. No Grange, if true to its obligation, can discuss political or religious questions, or call political conventions, nor nominate candidates, nor even discuss their merits in its meetings. Yet, the principles we teach underlie all true politics, all true statesmanship, and if properly carried out, will tend to purify the whole political atmosphere of our country. For we seek the greatest good to the greatest number. We must always bear in mind that no one, by becoming a patron of husbandry, gives up the inalienable right and duty which belongs to every American citizen to take a proper interest in the politics of their country. On the contrary, it is right for every member to do all in their power to influence for good the action of any political party to which they belong. It is their duty to do all that they can in their own party to put down bribery, corruption, and trickery, to see that none but competent, faithful, and honest people who will unflinchingly stand by their industrial interests or by our industrial interests, are nominated for all positions of trust, uh, and to have carried the principles which should, always have, uh, which should always characterize every patron, that the office should seek the person and not the person the office. We acknowledge the broad principle that difference of opinion is no crime, and hold that progress toward truth is made by differences of opinion, while the fault lies in bitterness of controversy. We desire a proper equality, equity, and fairness, protection for the weak, restraint upon the strong, in short, justly distributed burdens and justly distributed power. These are American ideas, the very essence of American independence, and to advocate contrary is unworthy of the children of an American republic. We cherish the belief that sectionalism is and of right should be dead and buried with the past. Our work is for the present and the future. In our agricultural... <laughs> I've, been, I've been trying. I've been trying really hard to take gendered language out of this as I read it, but... Uh... In our agricultural association and its purposes, we shall recognize no north, no south, no east, no west. It is reserved by every patron as the right of a free person to affiliate with any party that will best carry out their principles. <clears throat> Let me tell you, sight reading this, first time ever reading it, trying to do so without stuttering, uh, without overly pausing, and, and while tracking the sentences properly down the page, which is a difficulty of mine particularly, and doing all of that while trying to change out gendered language for non-gendered language the entire way through was a bit of a challenge. And yet, I feel I did well. <laughs> um, let's see, what is chat saying? I wonder if it's from groups like this that uh, Future Farmers of America ended up in schools. Um, 
Interestingly enough, Future Farmers of America uh, grew out of an organization that was founded here at Virginia Tech called Future Farmers of Virginia. Um, if you give me one second, I have that information and I will attempt to get it for you. That's something where I, I could probably do some digging and get some really interesting material. Um, where is, is this the one I want? Say it's on this part of the page, but I do not see it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the idea of creating a youth organization to complement high school agricultural education curricula was proposed by Virginia Polytechnic Institute professor of agriculture Walter Newman in a 1925 meeting with Edmund McGill, Henry C. Grossclose, and Henry W. Sanders. The discussion led later that year to the creation of the Future Farmers of Virginia which three years later grew into the nationwide Future Farmers of America. Professors, oh, and, and sorry, this was all part of an image caption from a, a forthcoming book uh, that I and some other archivists here um, have been working on for the past couple of years that will be published sometime. It was originally supposed to come out last month, but um, the publishing industry is, is very delayed by supply chain issues. Uh, so, so coming out sometime this year in honor of Virginia Tech's 150th anniversary. So uh, <laughs> Easter egg knowledge, yeah. <clears throat> so Future Farmers of America was an expansion of a program started here at Virginia Tech called Future Farmers of America um, that still goes strong to this day. Um, we've made a lot of progress. Our current goal, goods delivery problems are largely to have very optimized transport. Yes, we had uh, just-in-time delivery for just about everything, and when um, just-in-time, uh, when there was the slightest disruption to the shipping systems, the global shipping systems, that caused just-in-time delivery to become delayed delivery, almost universally. <coughs> and our, our system is just adjusting to the current moment. Uh, Grange is a supporter of FA. Uh, Future Farmers of America, though se separately founded. Thank you for that insight, Lord Portico. Um, so interesting, their statement of nonpartisanship. I do believe they are, they do um, lobby uh, today. If uh, I believe there's some notes about lobbying in. Um, the Wikipedia article. <coughs> As of 2013, the Grange continues to press for the causes of farmers, including issues of free trade and farm policy. In its 2006 Journal of Proceedings, the organization's report on its annual convention, the organization lays out its mission and how it works toward achieving it through fellowship, service, and legislation. Provides opportunities for individuals and families to develop to their highest potential in order to build stronger communities and states as well as a stronger nation. Um, they revised their mission statement in 2019 to the Grange strengthens individuals, families, and communities through grassroots action, service, education, advocacy, and agriculture awareness. As a nonpartisan organization, the Grange supports only policies, never political parties or candidates. Although the Grange was founded to serve the interests of farmers, because of the shrinking farm population, the Grange has begun to broaden its range to include a wide variety of issues, and anyone is welcome to join the Grange. <coughs> so, they do uh, political advocacy, but they...
do so uh, apparently from a policy standpoint and not from a certain political party standpoint, which might be why we don't hear about them too much. The next part of this happens to be the Constitution of the Straight State Grange of Connecticut. Um, I think we're going to look at some other documents instead, since um, unless somebody is particularly interested in the Connecticut organization's materials. But I thought, let's see, I have some documents here from 1928-1929 that are from Virginia Tech then known as Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Um, and this is from, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the collection. Give me one second, because it doesn't say on the folder. And while I know I have the information, it's just gonna take me one second to find it. Um, this is from the records of the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station. Um, <coughs> so, the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station was established in 1886 by an act of the Virginia General Assembly and funded by the Federal Hatch Act of 1887 for the purpose of providing practical and useful information on agricultural and scientific subjects. Originally, it was organized into three departments, Agriculture, Botany, and Entomology, which is the study of bugs. Uh, and chemistry. VAES was responsible for several agricultural research stations and laboratories throughout Virginia. On July 1st, 1966, the research activities of the Agricultural Experiment Station, as well as the Engineering Experiment Station, were combined under a university-wide research division. In 1978, VAES moved from the research division to the College of Agricultural, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Uh, so they're part of, um, <clears throat> it, essentially, Virginia Tech as a land-grant institution has uh, facilities in every county in Virginia, and VAES, uh, the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station, um, operates a lot of those facilities, or at least op has operations within a lot of those facilities. <coughs> so what I have here, I have not looked at. It is a folder labeled Grange 772, VPI 1928 to 1929. Um, <clears throat> and I thought it would be interesting to look at this and see what's up with Virginia Tech's Grange, apparently. Because um, apparently Virginia Tech had one. First things first. We have a postcard addressed to Dr. Drinkard. It doesn't say what year, oh, 1929. Christiansburg, Virginia, July 20th, 1929. The Grange picnic will be held in I think it says Craig's Woods, Christiansburg. This is a name I'm not familiar with. I could be wrong. I could also Google and see if such a thing exists. <coughs> so there is a Craig's Mountain nearby, it's possible there was something referred to as Craig's Woods back in the 20s. Uh, not something I'm familiar with, but that's my ge best guess as to what that handwriting says. Um, on Friday, August 2nd, National... <coughs> National Mother L.J. Labor. Pardon. <coughs> <coughs> oh dear. Uh, 
<clears throat> One second, a cough just decided it wanted to show up. <clears throat> I'm okay, Thorkel. <clears throat> if you've been watching uh, for the past few weeks, I've been dealing with some sinus stuff. Uh, I just had a, a second of really dry throat there, and I needed a, uh, some water. National mother L.J. Labor will be in, or will be present. Also, I apologize for the computer sound there. That should not have happened, but it did. It shouldn't happen again. <clears throat> uh, anyway, so they were having a Grange picnic. Oh, I'm glad you didn't hear it, because I definitely did. Here's another note here, July 23rd, 1929, W.J. Shelbourne, Christiansburg, Virginia. Grange picnic will be held August 2nd, and <coughs> uh, notify, oh, it's Flagswood. We have <clears throat> some actual memos, though, which are going to be much more interesting than just those short little announcements of a picnic. Or I hope so. I don't know. I haven't looked at this stuff before, so you're seeing it at the same time as I am uh, to determine whether there's anything particularly interesting. <clears throat> VPI Grange, number 772. I'm just going to zoom into page width here if I can so that you all get slightly larger text. And then we'll have the camera autofocus. <clears throat> July 24th, 1929, uh, Mr. W.J. Shelbourne, Christiansburg, Virginia. Dear Mr. Shelbourne, I am sorry I did not see you when you called at my office yesterday. I was in Roanoke at the time and did not get back to the office until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I enclose herewith a copy of the program for the Institute of Rural Affairs and for the State Farmers Institute to be held here at the college beginning July 30th and ending the evening of August 2nd. <clears throat> By referring to page 14 and 15 of this program, you will see that Mr. Lewis J. Tabor, Master of the National Grange, is on our program for speeches on August 1st and August 2nd. And now that I see it typed out like that, this is National Master L.J. Tabor, not National Mother L.J. Labor. Uh, and here, also, National Master, Notify Tabor. <clears throat> so, you know, diving through the documents, you, you can see how a mis misreading on something initially can be corrected with later information. Uh, I enclose here with copy of the program for the Institute of Rural Affairs and for the State Farmers Institute to be held here. Uh, did I already read that? I think I did. <clears throat> I will call to his attention the Grange picnic to be held in Flags Woods near Christiansburg on August 2nd. I will also call it to the attention of Mr. J.R. Horsley, master of the Virginia State Grange, who will also be here at that time. I am not entirely sure whether these gentlemen can get away from their engagements here in time to be present at the Grange picnic. Quite likely you will attempt some of... Uh, probably means attend. Uh, quite likely you will attend some of the meetings of the Farmers Institute, and you might also speak to Mr. Tabor and Mr. Horsley. I may say that practically all members of VPI Grange number 772 will be fully occupied with duties here in connection with the farmers' meeting. 
and I doubt whether very many of us will find it possible to attend the Grange picnic. You will understand, of course, that we feel duty-bound to stay here and show the visiting farmers every possible courtesy, answer their questions, and explain to them the various lines of work here. So I feel we shall be fully occupied on August 2nd. With kind, <clears throat> with kind personal regards, I am very truly yours. It just says master. Um, <clears throat> and then we have a letter, May 25th, 1929, addressed to Miss Maud E. Wallace, Agricultural Hall. Dear Miss Wallace, since you are lecturer in our local Grange, it occurs to me that it would be appropriate at our next meeting on Saturday night, June 1st, for you to present to our membership some of the points contained in a report made by the committee of which you are a member to the Agricultural Commission on the subject of conditions in the rural homes of Virginia. Ms. Bailey showed me a copy of this report and I consider it a very clear statement of the situation. It contains much information of interest to our membership. In the event you cannot be present at our meeting on June 1st, I suggest that possibly Ms. Bailey or some other member of the committee might substitute for you and I am sending a copy of this letter to Ms. Bailey and also a copy to Mr. A.H. Teske, very truly yours, Master. <clears throat> uh, Portico, I don't know. This is just from the records of the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station. I have no context beyond that as to who specifically within the AES was writing this. Uh, if uh, it's possible that will come uh, become apparent at some point depending <clears throat> it does look like we have a couple of signatures here on some of the letters so one of these letters another of these letters is signed aw drinker jr uh so i would have to look and see exactly who drinkard was uh we have something signed by jr horsley um <clears throat> It does look like the master of VPI Grange number 772 in 1929 was A.W. Drinker Jr. Uh, so I don't know beyond that. <clears throat> oh, 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 gotcha, Portico. Yeah, no, this is not the president's records collection. That, that is another folder that I have. This is, this is the Virginia Ag Experiment Station. Um, in, incidentally, if you look at the finding aid for the Virginia Agricultural Experiment Station, there are two folders listed um, with materials about Grange. Unfortunately, one of the boxes that contains one of those folders um, was scanned in our system to be sent back to storage in January of 2021, but was never scanned in at storage, so we don't know if it never left the building here or if it made it there and just didn't get scanned in uh, which meant uh, and we're we're figuring that out it's somewhere it's either here on a shelf or there on a shelf um, <clears throat> but because it never got scanned in uh, we weren't able to locate the box in time for me to pull the folder for this stream so <clears throat> I was gonna look I think Maud Wallace is a name I recognize um, just double checking. I think there's a building named after her here. I just need to double check and make sure that it's the right Wallace that I'm thinking of. And indeed, yes. Uh, so <clears throat> this letter from A.W. or A.W. Drinkard? Yes. This letter from A.W. Drinkard from the VPI Grange to Ms. Wallace, Ms. Maud E. Wallace, <clears throat> who apparently lectured for the Grange. <clears throat> Maud Wallace is a name that is sort of prominent here at Virginia Tech. Wallace uh, was a city extension agent from 1917 to 1919. <clears throat> Home demonstration agent from 1929 to 1937, 
head of home economics from 37 to 39, and assistant director of extension from 1938 to 1959 here at uh, Virginia Tech. Um, <laughs> the description here says, a powerhouse in her field, Wallace made home demonstration work in Virginia effective and efficient and reestablished VPI's home economics department. Among her national and state honors were the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Superior Service Award and Progressive Farmer Magazine's Woman of the Year. Uh, <clears throat> so there is a building on campus named after her, uh, Wallace Hall. It contains the administrative offices for the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences, uh, as well as the college's Department of Apparel, Housing and Resource Management, and the Department of Human Development. <clears throat> So I just, that name stuck out to me because I recognized it from the history of the institution here. Um, let's see. Here we have a letter on Virginia State Grange letterhead. May 21st, 1929. <clears throat> And let's see, it's addressed to Mr. Mark Turner, uh, Mr. J. N. Hubbard, Mr. F. O. Jones, and Mr. S. L. Cole, who were all masters of their local Pomonas. I do have, I, I do not have context for that term. Uh, it appears to be a type of Grange based on the text in this letter. If anybody, while I'm reading, cares to look that up and let me know what a Pomona is in regard to Grange, um, I would be interested. Dear brothers, I have previously written you in regard to a proposed field day in each of your Pomona Granges. As I have said, I believe we can make these field days an outstanding feature of Grange activity in Virginia for 1929, with immense benefits to the Grange and the communities in which they are held. This idea has seemed to meet with favorable favorable response. In carrying out such a program, I have been very anxious to have our national lecturer, Brother James C. Farmer, who is an outstanding man and Grange lecturer, to visit us and be present and take part in each of these field day occasions. I felt that he would bring us an inspiring message and be of material assistance to us in our Grange activities with the demands upon his time, both as national lecturer and master of his own state Grange, I realized that we could not expect more than a week of his time. As you may realize, it has been very difficult to select a week which would be acceptable to our Pomona that would suit Mr. Farmer's con convenience and at the same time not be in conflict with other activities which would interfere with such a field day in some locality. I have received a letter here at Montreat, North Carolina from Brother Farmer saying that he can give us the week of June 17th to 21st inclusive, uh, that he will have to be in New Hampshire for an engagement the night of the 22nd of June, tentatively selected the dates for your field days in your several Pomonas, Fairfax, Monday, June 17th, Peninsula, Tuesday, June 18th, Prince Charlotte, Wednesday, June 19th, and Floyd Montgomery, Friday, uh, June 21st. I will say in connection with the Floyd Montgomery Pomona that I hope it will be possible to have these two Pomonas unite in a field day to make it possible for Mr. Farmer to make his schedule and meet with both, which he should not otherwise do. <clears throat> An invitation has been extended through me from the Blacksburg VPI Grange to have this joint field day at the VPI, which, if sufficiently accessible, is an ideal place and would probably be acceptable to the Grayson people as well. If this cannot be arranged, then I suggest that the field day go to Floyd on the 21st of June. Oh no. Oh no, Mubot. What happened? Oh dear. <clears throat> Pomona is a regional grouping of granges. Thank you, Key Squared, named for an agricultural nymph from Greek mythology. Uh, there's a Pomona Grange Park in Washington State. Oh, Thorkel, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, Mubot caught your uh, your link and was not prepared to let you post links. Sorry about that, Thorkel.
In most states, multiple subordinate granges are grouped together to form Pomona granges. Typically, Pomona granges are made up of all the subordinates in a county. If you want to repost your link, you should be able to now, Thorkel. Um, my apologies for that. Uh, most, most of the people in, in chat can't post links without Mubot getting upset. <clears throat> I have to, I have to set up the permissions on that. Uh, and for people that come regularly, I've, I've basically added them to a list that says, um, don't yell at them if they post a link, but... <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, thank you for sharing, though, Thorkel. Um, apparently there is a spot on nationalgrange.org. Uh, a whole page. What's the purpose of a Pomona? Or what's the role of a Pomona? And its role is assist in ritualistic ceremonies as may be required. That's, that's really helpful, nationalgrange.org. Um, but also, yeah, uh, apparently it is um, more of a regional organization of individual granges, uh, according to the information gathered by others. So that is good to know. Let's see, what do we have here? May 25th, 1929, just received a letter from Mr. J.R. Horsley, Master of the Virginia State Grange, Stapleton, Virginia, relative to a proposed field day for the Montgomery County Pomona and for the Floyd Pomona. <clears throat> so Montgomery County um, is where Virginia Tech is located. Uh, Virginia Tech is in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, which is situated in Montgomery County, Virginia. Uh, Floyd County is the next county over. Uh, Floyd, Virginia is a town within Floyd County, Virginia. So um, when they're talking about the Montgomery County Pomona and the Floyd Pomona, these would be um, like county level organizations of granges uh, for two neighboring counties. <laughs> Ritualistic ceremony sounds like it's a cult. Well, so interestingly, um, Hannah, a lot of fraternal organizations adopt these sort of like um, ceremonial things um, that are they're very secretive about. Um, you hear about fictionalized versions of them uh, it, with regard to um, fraternities and sororities in colleges. Um, as well as extremely fictionalized accounts of them with regard to things like uh, the Masons or the Templar Order or things like that. Uh, but basically all of these uh, fraternal organizations that uh, they typically have some sort of secretive ceremonies that are uh, initiation ceremonies or uh, solidarity type things where it is meaningful for the people involved but would possibly be confusing to people outside or seem strange. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, but ritualistic ceremonies does sound sort of culty in, in, in its phrasing. Um, More like graduation rituals and things like that. Yeah. Still very weird. <laughs> um, I... <coughs> I uh, helped to recharter a chapter of a professional fraternity when I was an undergraduate student. Uh, so as an undergrad, um, the conservatory that I attended uh, did not have an active chapter of Phi Mu Alpha Sinfonia, which is a, uh, a music fraternity, a professional music fraternity. Um, and I was part of a group of undergraduate students who helped to recharter and reactivate 
uh, Find New Alpha Symphonia at Shenandoah University. Um, and from that, I am aware of uh, the types of ritual that are done. And so the, the initiation ritual for Find New Alpha Symphonia had certain symbology to it that was connected to music um, in various different ways. Uh, and it, it was meaningful in sort of having everybody go through the same sort of experience. Um, you had to learn the meaning behind the different symbols and how they upheld the values of the organization and things like that. Um, so it was sort of a bonding, or, uh, a bonding experience uh, for the basically pledging to be a part of that community. Um, it's still weird, but it had meaning behind it. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, just looking to see. There's a lot of stuff here about organizing these field days. I'm looking to see if there's anything else in particular in here that might be more interesting than uh, letters back and forth to try and organize field days. Like maybe telling us what the field day was going to be. <clears throat> Hey, here's one <clears throat> that sort of says <laughs> the days of two spaces after a period. Oh, yeah, indeed, actually. Um, <laughs> that was something that when I was in school was just like pounded into me. Like, you must always put two spaces after a period. <clears throat> There's no actual reason why you need to at this point. I'm not certain why it was necessary in the first place, but it was a thing. <laughs> uh, Lord Portico, I, uh, considering that I know where this conversation might go um, about two spaces after period and punctuation in general, knowing that uh, both you and Philip have law degrees, um, I will just throw out, what is your opinion on whether a period is italicized or not? <clears throat> uh, and let you ponder that or chat about that while I read this letter. Uh, VPI Grange number 772, Blacksburg, Virginia, June 15th, 1929. Dear member, Please read the attached notice concerning the Grange Field Day to be held on the VPI campus on June 21st. The members of your family and you are cordially invited to be present at the speaking and to join in the picnic dinner. Be sure to bring along a well-filled basket, which will go far toward making the Field Day a success. Our local Grange is endeavoring to show visiting members every possible courtesy and we desire that the visitors may receive a favorable impression of the work and activities of the local Grange, and at the same time see something of the work of the college. We are counting on your assistance to make the event a great success. Fraternally yours, A.W. Drinker, Jr., Master, A.H. Teske, Secretary. <clears throat> I mean, Lord Portico, uh, I... Uh, all I remember about italicized periods is that uh, people who I've known who went to law school, it was extremely important and they had to be very meticulous down to that they would have marks taken off if a period did not register as being italicized even though there was zero visual difference between a non-italicized and an and, and italicized period. So in looking at a document like this, there is no way for me to know if a period that is on this page is italicized, but apparently that was quite important um, in uh, some of the items turned in for law school. That, that's all. You brought up punctuation and I had to go there because of fixed width font on typewriters, made it more legible with the advent of word processors and proportional fonts, the need for double spaces 
for legibility became obsolete. Thank you for clarifying, Thorpal. I'm sure I have looked at that before. Uh, yeah, Thorpal, it's probably not even possible to, to italicize a period on a typewriter, but um, word processors will let you know, especially if you're turning something in uh, as a word document. Have hauled away arranged cups of ice cream. We found the most important thing in all of the planning for these field days. There's a note to have somebody arrange for cups of ice cream. Incidentally, there is a dairy processing place here on campus. There's an ice cream thing that gets done here where ice cream um, that is made on campus uh, gets sold at sporting events. I want to say basketball games in particular, but I don't, uh, I, I don't know the details. I probably should never have brought it up, but uh, ice cream made me think of it. Um, I don't have the details, and I'm not going to find them. I've never actually had it myself, because I have not been to the games. <clears throat> but uh, a food production is a, is a thing here at Tech, including uh, most recently, um, there's an official university beer, because there's a beer brewing uh, program offered here. Uh, that teaches people how to brew beer, and as part of that, the institution partnered with a local brewery and developed a Virginia Tech beer. File under VPI Grange. Field day for the Granges of Floyd, Montgomery, and Grayson counties to be held on the VPI campus Friday, June 21st, 1929. The local Granges in the above-named counties are invited by the Pomona Granges to units in a field day event on the campus of the Virginia Polytechnic Institute at Blacksburg on June 21st. The field day was suggested by Mr. J. R. Horsley, master of the Virginia State Grange, who will be present on that occasion. Mr. James C. Farmer, national lecturer of the Grange, will be the principal speaker. Brother Farmer is an outstanding man and a recognized leader in Grange affairs, and he will bring us an interesting message. It is suggested that each family bring a picnic basket dinner with a little su surplus to take care of the visitors who may be present. The dinner, sh the dinner hour should be made the occasion for getting acquainted with each other, for cheer and good fellowship. The following is the tentative program for the occasion. 10.30 a.m. Address of Welcome. Dr. Julian A. Burris, President of the Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Um, there's also a building named after him. Uh, it is the main administration building on campus. He's not an uncontroversial figure. Um, <clears throat> addresses are 10, 1045 a.m. Addresses by Mr. S. L. Cole, Master of the Floyd County Pomona, and by Mr. W. J. Shelburne, Master of the Montgomery County P Pomona. Uh, 11 a.m. Remarks by Masters of Local Granges. 11.15 a.m. Address by Mr. J. R. Horsley, Master of the Virginia State Grange. 11.30 a.m. Addressed by Mr. James C. Farmer, lecturer of the National Grange. 12.30 p.m. Picnic dinner spread on, spread on one table. 2 p.m. An inspection tour of the college grounds and buildings and a visit to the college barns to see the herds and also a trip to the experimental um, plants and orchards. I think that is what it means. Uh, so, yes, uh, it looks like part of their field day here on campus included um, visiting the barns and the orchards and I would assume probably also the greenhouses um, because, as I said, our campus is very steeped in agriculture. 
there are indeed barns, and um, it wouldn't have been at this time, but uh, today uh, we also include um, a lot of veter veterinary science uh, instruction here. Um, Virginia Tech is home to the Virginia, Maryland uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and so, yeah, there's the barns serve dual functions with regard to agriculture and veterinary medicine with, when it comes to that. But then there's also um, a really large uh, area of greenhouses and large orchard areas. Um, we still have a place that's called the Turfgrass Center, but we don't really do turfgrass research at the Turfgrass Center anymore. Um, but for a while, there was an area of, of turfgrass research. Uh, turfgrass being like the grass that you put in your yard to cover the ground. And there was a whole field where they researched different types of grass for covering ground. Um, it's really quite fascinating that there's all, all of that stuff gets studied here. Um, <clears throat> all members of the Grange in these counties should make their plans to attend this field day. Invite your neighbors who may be interested in the work of the Grange to join in this picnic event so that they may learn more about the purposes of the Grange and its methods of operation. This is our first attempt to hold a Grange field day and therefore let each and every one do their part to make the event a success. The undersigned was requested to serve on a committee to make local arrangements and further information about the field day can be obtained by writing to him. A.W. Drinker, Jr., Master of BPI Grange, number 772, Blacksburg, Virginia. Hi, Crafty Becky. How are you today? Oh, and Kira, Kira got me the information I needed. Uh, milkshakes are not from campus products anymore, so much as it's done as a fundraiser for the Dairy Club. However, we did have a campus, right, we did have a creamery on campus to supply campus well into the 20th century. Thank you, Kira. I had thought that that was still actively done, but uh, thank you for the clarification. <clears throat> Let's see, what do we have? Uh, I want to look at some of the other stuff we've got. We could continue in here forever, but I have at least two more folders of original documents, as well as some cookbooks we could look at. And um, we have about 45 minutes left, so I want to make sure that we look at some of the other items. I'm doing good, Crafty Becky. I'm glad that you are as well. Uh, recovering from some sinus stuff, I already had <coughs> to take a moment and drink some water. <clears throat> but. Uh, my voice is much, much better than it was on Monday, so. All right, the next folder that we have just says Grange. It's folder number 353. I know the date range is 1950 to 1961. And this comes from the records of the office of the president, John Red Hutchison. Uh, <laughs> so the president in this case is referring to the president of Virginia Polytechnic Institute uh, John Red Hutchison um, do, do, do. <clears throat> in January 1945 he was appointed executive assistant to President Ju Julian Burris but soon took on many of the president's duties when Burris became ill he was elected Virginia Tech's ninth president in August 1945. In December 1946, he became ill and was granted sick leave, at which time Walter Newman took over the duties of president. Although he recovered from his illness, he did not return to his position as president. Instead, the Board of Visitors appointed Hutchison to VPI's first chancellor, or as VPI's first chancellor in 1947, and Newman became VPI's 10th president. <clears throat> so this is the records of President John Hutchison, who was only president for one and a little over one and a quarter years. <coughs> uh, 
And he's got some records here regarding VPI Grange number 772. Again, I have not looked at these. I just found that they existed. <laughs> Portico, I'm not sure what you're shocked about. <clears throat> um, I'm confused myself. I don't see it, <clears throat> so uh, I don't know that you can. I can, I can give you permission to, but I, I see the post, but not the link. Uh, All right, dear member, our annual VPI Grange meeting tentatively set for 4 p.m. Tuesday, September 5th, must be put postponed due, as too many members can't be present. Apparently in 1961, Grange dues were $3 per member. That is probably the most interesting thing about this letter to me is that the dues were $3 per member. <coughs> Interesting. It just shows as uh, asterisks for me, Portico. Even even after I permitted it, it doesn't show up as a link. It just shows up as asterisks. It doesn't even tell me it removed it. So I'm not certain what the setup is on the, the VTUL Studios channel. I did create the uh, um, the finding aid command. It just doesn't have the individual links for the collections. <clears throat> Let's see, I won't be able to attend. Here's dues payment. Oh, this one's an interesting one. Blacksburg, Virginia, December twentieth, nineteen fifty-two. Two members of the VPI Grange 772. Try and get this straightened out on your screen for you. Our treasury is completely out of funds, and we do not have the money to pay our Grange dues to the Virginia State Grange for the quarter ending December 31st, 1952. In fact, it was necessary to use a few pennies that we had on hand for buying stamps in order to have enough money to pay the dues last quarter. As you probably know, our Grange dues have been increased from 30 cents to 60 cents per member per quarter. It therefore will be necessary for us to increase our annual dues in the very near, very near future, since several of our members are in area or are in arrears of their dues. If everyone will pay up through December 31st, 1952, we should have enough money to cover our dues for this quarter and the first quarter of 1953. We should have a Grange meeting early in 1953 to make a decision on this matter of dues and other matters concerning the maintenance of our Grange. I hope that Master Hummel will have returned to Blacksburg by the time that we have this meeting. I am showing below a statement of your dues and would greatly appreciate your sending me a check as soon as convenient. With best wishes, I am fraternally yours, E.T. Swink, Secretary. And it <clears throat> thankfully appears that... Um, Hutchison had was paid in full and just has a statement showing what upcoming dues are going to be. Um, I just find it interesting we find out that they had some money issues. But a lot of these are just dues letters which is sadly not what I was hoping to find. Now this is interesting. I don't know how interesting, but it, 
It gives me a piece of information that we had not had previously. So uh, November 9th, 1950, two members of VPI Grange 772, I would like to call your attention to the following announcements. One, the VPI Student Grange will meet in the auditorium of the Agricultural Engineering Building at 7.30 p.m. on Monday night, November 13th. Master Bates has invited any of our members who care to do so attend this meeting. There will be an initiation ceremony for new members in the Student Grange. Any of you who can attend will, I am sure, enjoy the student program. And then it goes on about dues. But this is the first document that we've seen that mentioned that there was a student chapter uh, here at the institution. <clears throat> Uh, from the Wikipedia article, I knew that the organization as a whole has membership statuses for children, uh, but this was the first time that we've had a mention of there being a specifically a student grange here at Tech. Uh, so that to me was somewhat interesting. But yeah, overall, um, these these are mostly dues letters, which less interesting, unless you're specifically researching um, the National Grange organization and are trying to chart all sorts of details, including cost of dues, uh, in which case le dues letters like that would give you some time frames for uh, when certain costs were required for participating in the organization. <clears throat> this next one I don't know how particularly interesting it's going to be. I have not really looked at it either. Um, as is the case with most of the things I share on this show, I pull them and we look at them together. Uh, and I pulled what I could find that referenced the Grange. Um, initiation ceremony sounding like a cult. You know they're not. Terminology isn't helping. Yeah, true. This Next item comes from the Diane Elliott Geyer Architecture Papers. Um, and just to mention who Geyer is, um, born in Geneva, Switzerland, architect, environmentally conscious designer, teacher, artist, and writer, mostly practiced in the United States uh, from 76 to 79, went to the University of Colorado Denver, thesis on proposing a mixed-use hospital expansion for the new National Jewish Hospital U University of Colorado Medical Center Conference. Um, <coughs> devoted her career to examining what architecture can do and to building a more sustainable future through community empowerment. Has worked as a teacher, organizer, volunteer, and advocate for sustainability and environmental awareness in design. So this is um, a collection that we have specifically for, uh, as part of our um, International Archive of Women in Architecture collections. Uh, and this one, box nine, folder 20, Building Assessment and Feasibility Study, uh, Gihon Valley Grange Hall and Valley House Hotel, December 1999. So. <clears throat> this, I did glance at it um, this morning as I pulled the folder out of the box in preparation for the stream today, uh, and it appears to be sort of an architectural assessment, building assessment, of, um, of the building uh, to give feedback. As the feasibility study portion of it is looking at uh, potential renovations for the hall. Um, I think it's worth looking at specifically because we've, we've had glimpses, we've looked at purposes for the organization, we've seen some letters about, you know, organizing picnics and things like that. Um, one of the things that is particularly recognizable uh, for the Grange movement um, that I've been able to identify in the few Google searches that I did, as well as like mentions um, a couple weeks ago when the topic came up, um, 
is this the Grange Hall. There's a building uh, that is associated with this organization. And so this takes a look at a Grange Hall, uh, which I thought was interesting and worth looking at. So this report is funded in part by a technical assistance grant from the Lake Champlain Basin Program and Preservation Trust of Vermont. Their assistance is greatly appreciated. Preliminary feasibility study based on evidence available from a visual inspection of the properties. Proposed uses. The Gihon Valley Grange Hall, built in 1910 by the Valley Hall Association, the Gihon Valley Grange Hall was taken over by the Grange in 1935. The building has continuously served the community of North Hyde Park as a large function hall until very recently. By the late 1980s, membership in the Grange had diminished and become so elderly that raising money for the building's upkeep was impossible. As the Grange disbanded, the Hyde Park Select Board helped transfer the ownership of the hall to the town and put it under the aegis of the Hyde Park Historical Society. It's currently used intermittently for private social functions and public fundraisers. Building holds many wonderful stories, such as how local citizens once owned stock in the building. It's a key building to the area, both because of the memories uh, it represents and its location within the heart of the village. <clears throat> so they're wanting to rehab the building. So my purpose in looking at this right now, since we're interested particularly in the Grange, is not so much in like the hotel or what they want to use the building for. I want to specifically look at the building itself and there are some images. Um, but basically I don't care about the costs for renovation. I don't care about uh, what proposed use is. I'm more concerned with what does the building look like? We know it was used for large functions in the town. Um, so we have an index of photos here. There are photos in here. Um, front doors, steps, side view of entry, southwest corner of the building, stair with additional handrail section, main hall, etc., etc. Um, I mean, these are just going to be pictures of a, an, an old building, but I thought it was interesting enough because these are, honestly, I found pictures. They're not related to the Virginia Tech Grange. They're not related, but pictures of a Grange Hall that are in our collection. And, and this one was by far the most interesting, like kind of scavenger hunt episode of like, here's a topic, see what you've got. And I think I found some interesting material. Um, So here you can get a nice exterior of the hall itself. It just looks like a house, honestly. It looks like a somewhat run-down house that I'm sure viewers in Europe will be like, it's not even that old. But um, for America, something built in the early 1900s. It, it's old. <laughs> um, especially a freestanding building like that. Uh, it's got large open space. Looks like dish storage for the large main meeting hall here. Um, a lot of these are detail shots because they were doing a feasibility assessment and looking at structural, how structurally sound the building is, things like that. Um, but like this is a large open area. It looks like there's possibly a stage at the back there. Um, would have been like a, a large function hall, like high school dance or dances could have been held there weddings, reunions, um, things like that. There was um, a communal 
gathering space similar to this in my family's hometown in Southwest Iowa, uh, where my grandparents booked the hall uh, for their 50th wedding anniversary. And people gathered, and it was a, a large open space like this um, that was available for community gatherings of, of that sort. Um, I don't know how common those are anymore today. We've got some basic architectural drawings of the spaces um, expected for a uh, feasibility study here, renova potential renovation study. Uh, here we get a full external where we can see the width of the building. It appears to be about three stories. We know it has a basement because that's been referenced a few times. Um, but honestly, it just looks like a large house. Uh, it doesn't appear to be like downtown. It doesn't appear to have a lot of other buildings nearby. There are community buildings in a lot of small towns that would serve that. Yes. Um, I just don't know how typical it is to necessarily find them all today. I mean, outside of small rural towns. Uh, large function spaces in in sort of mid to larger sized cities tend to be like hotel ballrooms or things like that, um, where these are much. These feel more like uh, the basement of the local church or something like that, um, which has a, a, a very different feel than a large ballroom at a at a hotel, and also costs a lot less to use. Uh, Looks like they have porches on the uh, the main two levels on one side of the building here. But honestly, this this could just be a house on the street. It's just a particularly large house. Um, <laughs> we get some uh, some look at the plumbing and ductwork. <laughs> um, and this is also uh, fairly typical of older buildings um, in rural America, honestly. Uh, this appears to be a building that has been unoccupied for a little while. You can see there's some water damage, there's some uh, fallen plaster. Um, and so in looking at rehabbing this, they'd be looking to make sure that things are still structurally sound. Uh, this looks like a lot of, I, I believe that this is in Vermont, um, but this could be any rural part of America, honestly. It's not an unfamiliar sight to me. Uh, community spaces that don't come with the assumption of buying things are few and far between these days. That is true, Key Squared. The little town you live near that has a population of around 200 has a nice community building one can rent. And the town you work in, population 8,000-ish, has a really nice community building one can rent. You think they want too much money to rent it, but it's a nice facility. Yeah, I, well, and it, it was definitely a, a decent facility. It was rentable, the, the one that my grandparents used for their 50th wedding anniversary. Um, I have no idea what the cost was at the time, uh, honestly, this was probably, this was definitely more than 20 years ago. And that building has burned since then. So I, I can't even like go and look and like check what their rates are because that town no longer has a large community facility like that anymore because it, the building it was in burned. Um, anyway, that was why I pulled this collection, was just to kind of get a, glan a glance at, like, what's a Grange Hall look like? And it looks just like a large house or, um, uh, like a rural church in America or something like that, a community hall. Um, pretty normal place, nothing particularly mysterious about it, not like, uh, 
some of the fictions of what you expect from a, uh, a fraternal organization. Um, not going to say, Hannah, uh, that, at least not on stream, not going to say, uh, not going to confirm if that is the town or not. Um, that That's just getting too much into the, the details of personally identifiable stuff. Uh, but I'll happily confirm on Discord for you. I don't mind that. It's just not live on stream. Uh, so I did find, in looking at this, a couple of cookbooks uh, that are National Grange cookbooks. Um, and so I thought it was interesting. Uh, unsurprisingly, we have a lot of cookbooks. Uh, <laughs> And so this is National Grange. Um, they published their own cookbooks. It, this is Family Cookbook from Country Kitchens, a collection of family-tested recipes from rural America. <laughs> so is that cover art a Grange range? T squared. Well done. It is indeed a grain, a, a grange range, apparently. Um, so what I find, like, we can look at some recipes, but I'm more interested in looking at this at why they published it, uh, what their purpose is behind it, uh, sort of that kind of information. Um, so I think that's what I'm going to focus on here. Dear patrons and friends, several years ago when we published the National Grange Bicentennial Year Cookbook. Hey, look, I think that's this one. Because I don't know if you can see in the bottom corner here. It says United States Constitution Bicentennial. Uh, and it's a little symbol, I think. A little blurry there. I can try and autofocus that. Uh, this is the Bicentennial Year Cookbook from the National Grange. Um, several years ago when we published the National Grange Bicentennial Year Cookbook, <clears throat> we thought that would be our one and only venture into the cooking business, or cookbook business. However, much to our delight, we discovered that lots of people are hungry for and appreciate recipes from scratch. We received hundreds of wonderful letters about our first book and many asking if we would ever publish another one. Fortunately, with over a quarter of a million women in the Grange, <clears throat> we have a wealth of culinary talent. <clears throat> I, I, the year on this <clears throat> is 1979, so genderizing cooking to imply it's women's work makes sense for the time. <laughs> Um, okay, most of our Grange women, born and raised in rural America, still believe country cooking is healthier and more economical. We are happy once again to share with you a selection of recipes from their personal files, which encourages the use of American agricultural products. You will find that rarely will you have to make a special trip to the store. Most of the ingredients you already have on your shelves or in your refrigerator. In addition to the hundreds of family-tested recipes in each of the main sections, there are also re recipes for men <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, I need to take just a sip of water again. As we hit another gender stereotype. Uh, there are also recipes for men from men and recipes for young folks from our Young Grange members. You were trying to look up pricing for rent 
in the community center in the town near you, but they don't have it available online. One of the other ones was 200 to with a $200 refundable deposit. Honestly, that's not super terrible. Uh, it does 1787 to 1987. It is the <clears throat> bicentennial of the Constitution, is what it's saying. And and in fact, you are you are probably correct, Thorkel. That this is not the book that it's referencing. It is probably referencing. One that I either don't have or didn't pull. Uh, <clears throat> because, yeah, you're, you're probably right. This is from 79, so it would have been referencing the 1976 bicentennial, and this bicentennial is the bicentennial of the Constitution, which was 87. So, uh, thank you for catching that, Thorpe. As a special treat, there's a VIP section with interesting recipes from some of our friends in the nation's capital. Finally, there is a section of recipes for diabetics, which I'm sure many of you will find extremely helpful. We are indeed... That's actually amazing. Uh, specific diabetic-friendly recipes in a 1979 cookbook. That is amazing to me. We are indeed grateful to our publishers, the fine folks at Favorite Recipes Press in Nashville, Tennessee, for their months of labor, counsel, and encouragement, and of course to our Grange women uh, who make all of this possible. Happy eating fraternally and sincerely, Mrs. Jenny, Jenna Grobski. Grob Grobski. Grobski? Not certain how to pronounce that name. <clears throat> Now I'm really curious. I, I need to find this diabetic-friendly cookbook or dishes. So there's a whole section. Special diabetic recipes, 252. <clears throat> we have not seen this in a cookbook that we've looked at before on stream. I am interested. I'm going to zoom out a little bit. <clears throat> so, special diabetic recipes, an entire section in this cookbook. In 1979, that seems like amazing representation for a, a, a disability in 1979. Um, wholesome, delicious, and appetizing are the words to describe a diabetic, a diabetic diet. <clears throat> because it allows such a variety of favorite foods. A balanced diabetic menu can include lean meats, fish, poultry, eggs, cheese, and milk products, plus a wide range of vegetables and many fruits. A list like that makes it hard to believe that once a person is diagnosed as having diabetes, their eating habits have to change. Protein, fat, and calorie intake must be watched, but carbo carbohydrate intake must be monitored carefully so the body receives only what is available or what it is able to handle. Interestingly, even the way that it's talking about like proteins, fats, calories, uh, carbohydrates, even the terminology that they're using is familiar to us from today. And um, I don't know that I considered that they were using that language as early as the uh, late 1970s. Interesting that they weren't concerned with lactose at the time. Um, yeah, I, so lactose intolerance is um, definitely did not get uh, a lot of public attention, uh, as well as like um, wheat gluten, gluten sensitivities, things like that, uh, particularly from celiac disease or, or things like that, um, were not well known. Uh, it's interesting to me that lactose intolerance, as you note, was not very well addressed, <clears throat> considering large portions of the world are lactose intolerant, uh, owing to it not being culturally common to introduce lots of dairy products. 
but this was written for an American audience with the assumption of American being uh, European-derived American households that use a lot of dairy products throughout their entire lives. Um, <clears throat> Rental for the community building in the town you work in is 500 for the day, 750 on a Friday or Saturday. Long list of policies. Some are a little strict, but it's not your building. Yeah. Oh, lactose as in, sh as in the sugar. Gotcha. I was thinking dairy products. Diabetic diets have been around for a while, even before the discovery of insulin. And I don't know... Also, high puddle blood. I don't know when that happened. Um... I've never looked, uh, but apparently the condition has been known since ancient Egypt. Uh... Credit for the formal discovery of a role for the pancreas in causing diabetes is dated to 1889. Interesting. I just, it, it, it's interesting to me that they had an entire section on this um, in the 70s because it, it, it's, a, it's a disability condition and to reserve an entire section of a cookbook specifically for this condition uh, just, just seemed a little out of place in a book from the late 70s. I, I'm, despite their issues with like gendered language, uh, this is really interesting to me that this is here. The recipes in this section have been submitted by Mrs. Melvin Stepton, or Stepan of Quincy Grange number 990 in Quincy, Washington. And all Grange members truly appreciate her thoughtful cooperation. Helpful hints for these special diabetic uh, diabetic recipes include one, measure ingredients carefully, two, always soften gelatin in at least one teaspoon cold water before using, three, where recipes call for lightly oiled or greased dishes, it is suggested that you use vegetable cooking spray according to directions on the container. Mrs. Stepan uh, suggests the use of Frutex from the Crescent Company as a thickening agent in whipped toppings. I have no idea what, what Frutex is. Um, I'm also not familiar with the Crescent Company. I, I suspect Kira would know. We have a lot of nutrition manuals from the late 19th and early 20th century that get into this topic as well. We may have to pull and do like an entire stream on um, 19th and 20th century... In... Uh, uh, nutrition information for diabetics. That seems like an interesting topic that had never occurred to me. It is strongly recommended that you check with your doctor before using any sweetener, artificial or natural, if you are on a diabetic diet. <clears throat> Insulin was discovered in the 20s. Yep. life expectancy upon diagnosis was very short prior to the discovery of insulin. Yeah, so I think out of this stream, I have like two new topics to, to look at. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other one was. What was the other one? If, if chat wants to remind me, we're basically at the end of time, so I, I just need to um, make a note here. Uh, future streams. Uh, Thank you, Thorkel. <laughs> International Order of Oddfellows. Um, C. 
So, uh... <laughs> no, no, uh, Kira, that, that is totally fine. Um, I will, will look at that for a couple weeks from now. Um, coming up on uh, Archival Adventures, I'm just going to pull up my spreadsheet that tells me what I have planned. Because, um... While I picked the thing, I don't remember. Uh, I know it's aviation related for next week. Come on, spreadsheet. Right, uh, so for next week, we will be looking at the aviation brochures and pamphlets collection. Um, I had a glance in. It is what it sounds like. It is brochures for planes and plane parts. Uh, so it should be somewhat interesting. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to switch to my face to talk about this. Uh, but um, yeah, I hope that you all had, had fun with me kind of exploring what we had about um, the National Grange. It was something I was completely unfamiliar with before this stream. Uh, so I hope you learned something. I definitely learned something myself. Um, I, I know what uh, the National Grange is. I know there was an organization here at Tech. Um, they put out cookbooks. They had... Uh, they still exist, and they're out there in, in the United States advocating for um, policies to promote equity in the distribution of food and support of agriculture in this country. Uh, so interesting. Um, Frutex, a plant with a woody, durable stem, but less than a tree or shrub. Frutex Australia, Australian family-owned company dedicated to delivering quality ingredients to the food industry, 1968. By yeah, I don't, I don't know, Hannah. It's, uh, it, it looked like a brand name to me. Um, anyway, uh, coming up next week, aviation brochures and pamphlets collection, and then um, pulling from what we talked about. I will look at two weeks from now, uh, trying to do International Order of Odd Fellows, and then three weeks from now on um, the 4th of May, <clears throat> looking to see what we have on uh, nutrition manuals for diabetics from the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, so that is uh, a peek at what's coming up soon. Agrophiles, the granges out there. Um, hopefully you found your time here interesting and educational. Uh, hopefully you will return in the future for more of the same. That would be amazing. Um, I do think, let's see, I need to mention things. <laughs> um, if you are not familiar, uh, uh, this show goes out on two channels. It goes out on Rogan27. It also goes out on uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. VTUL Studios has a lot of other programming. The uh, next item up for twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios is coming up in just about an hour. It is a, um, uh, an episode of The Role of Play, um, which is a ongoing series of TTRPG one-shots. Uh, hosted on the library's Twitch channel. Uh, this live play, actual play, will be a D&D 5th edition one-shot uh, with music faculty from Virginia Tech playing a game based on the opera uh, Rusalka by Dvorak. Uh, so if you're at all interested in that, uh, be sure to stop by twitch.tv slash vtulstudios in an hour at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, Coming up tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. on VTUL Studios is Ethereal World Building, uh, which is a show about virtual environment design, so 3D design of virtual environments. 
uh, and we'd love to have you join us for that. Uh, coming up on Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time is Finale Fridays, which is a music composition uh, stream where uh, they're working in the software Finale uh, to write music. And then on Tuesdays at 3 p.m. Um, Eastern on VTUL Studios uh, is Maker Max's Marvelous Mockups, where um, our head of the 3D Design Studio, or sorry, the, the I don't remember what the studio's name is off the top of my head right now. Anyway, Max will be here and he'll be showing you how to write, or how to create um, 3D models for use in 3D printers. So uh, any of those things are coming up. And of course, on Wednesdays at 2.30 p.m., I'm here uh, to share with you things from the archives. Uh, so hopefully we will see you soon for one of those. Um, let me uh, check and see who we're going to raid. I had a thought today. I just don't know if that thought is going to work. And indeed, I think we are going to raid someone who we've raided before, uh, but that we don't often go to because we go from educational to then gaming. But um, haven't raided uh, Stephen in a while. Uh, Stephen, I think the last time we raided him went by the, uh, uh, the Twitch tag Stephen Kill, uh, and now is Stephen Joyce. Uh, but uh, we're gonna pop over there. Uh, looks like he's got a game called A Memoir Blue that he's playing today. Um, it appears to be an underwater type game at the moment. Uh, I don't know much about it, but he's been raising money uh, for a charity called Players vs. Cancer. Um, and so I think we'll pop over there. And um, if you care to join in and contribute some money to Players vs. Cancer, it's an organization that supports uh, the American Association of Cancer Research. Uh, to help find cures for cancer. So I thought we'd pop in there and say hello and potentially support his efforts to raise money on behalf of cancer research. So um, yeah, hopefully I see you next week and hopefully uh, some of you will pop over to BTUL Studios in about an hour for the role of play. Until then, I will say good night and goodbye.